Okay, so I'm going to talk a little about saving science and, and how I ended up doing something I never really thought I'd end up doing in the beginning. Right back in, in Sheffield, back in England, where I got the accent, I thought I was going to be a... <laughs> I thought I was going to be a scientist. I was going to discover new things. I really wanted to help people understand the world around them and make things better. So I, I started off doing a, a degree in physics. I really liked it. I decided I wanted to actually take it further and become a, a real scientist and get a PhD. Four years later, I became Dr. Hanwell, and no one ever calls me that anymore. It's fine. <laughs> but I, I was one of those people in the white lab coat. I had my very own lab coat. I worked in a clean room. I've synthesized gold nanoparticles. And I found a lot of the tools were, were dissatisfying. They didn't do what I thought they should do. And a lot of the standards in terms of data, how we transferred data between different groups, how we communicated our results, was very dissatisfying. I took a postdoc in Pittsburgh, and I moved to a very different part of America to the first I experienced, which was out in California in Silicon Valley. And I, I learned a little bit more about America, and I also learned that Things weren't much better in America in terms of how we communicated science and how we published it. So I, I thought about how I might change that and how I might be a part of the change. So more recently, uh, my daughter was extremely cooperative and was born right between submitting two proposals and giving this talk. She was born less than a week ago, so my wife and my daughter and my new little big brother are doing great. And um, this is other aspects of what you do. My, my son was born in Pittsburgh at the end of my postdoc, and my daughter was born yeah, less than a week ago. And I really wanted to figure out, yeah, how could I actually improve the state of science, science and scientific communication? Science itself is really about standing on the shoulders of giants, and there's a lot of argument about even where this quote comes from. But uh, it really is, you build on the work of others, you build upon the knowledge that came before you, and you can't do it all on your own. We can't invent algebra and then understand quantum mechanics all in one lifetime even. It's just too much work for us. Works now. <laughs> so the Royal Society is one of the oldest learned societies. The, um, the crown blessed it, so it must be okay. And their, their original motto was nullius and verba, because academics like to talk in Latin, because no one else understands Latin. But really, it means take nobody's word for it. It's a rough translation. And it's a statement of people in science are learning about the world around them, and you should trust them, but you shouldn't necessarily take their word for it. You should verify the, the answers. There are no absolute truths in science. Everything is about discovery, and things that were once true before can become less true or even invalid in the future as we make new discoveries about how things work. And so the phrase, trust but verify, became quite popular in science. We want to trust the work of others, but we also want to verify it. We want to understand, did they account for all the variables? Did they make sure that they controlled the experiment properly? And did they communicate all the pieces of the experimental setup to allow us to actually replicate that? But over the years, verification became less and less of a part of the actual act of science. The Royal Society used to actually practice replicating experiments, and they did this very regularly. There's some really mundane experiments as well as some very critical experiments. But over the centuries, this has gotten worse and worse. And now when we publish papers, we really don't do a lot of verification. We do peer review, but a lot of it is more scientific proofreading. We're not, we're not replicating the experiment. We're not doing it again. We're often not even repeating the, the statistical analysis. We're looking at it to see if it looks about right, but we're not necessarily actually checking. Members uh, PhD comics, this got me through a lot of my PhD, helping you see the, the funny side of being an academic. But we really are taught as, as PhD candidates how to speak in a, in a different kind of language. When we say to the best of the author's knowledge, yeah, we really are saying, we think it's about right, but we didn't really have the time to do a big literature search. So. <laughs> and this is a nice uh, comic strip you should visit, it, where it shows you a lot of the funnier sides of... Um, taking part in the PhD system, learning how to become one of the, the foremost experts in a particular area. But really what science has always been about and what it should get back to is reproducibility. But in order to reproduce experiments, we need to get better at communicating what we did and how we did it. I'll give you another example of the Mechanical Turk. In the 18th century, there were claims that an automaton had been created, could play chess, he could beat you. And this machine understood the rules of chess, and you could sit there and play against this machine. And this would be taken to different fairs around the world, and people would 
tried to beat the automaton, the mechanical Turk, and uh, when you opened up the doors, you opened up that box, you saw not an advanced computer, some kind of mechanical computer. It was a, a little man who hid in the box and pulled a series of levers in order to be able to make it appear that the automaton was playing chess. It wasn't until a few hundred years later that we came up with the, the necessary knowledge to really have a computer play chess and beat real people. We need to get back to showing what's inside the box, and this has gotten worse and worse in recent years in science, where there are too many closed boxes. We're trusting far too much. So often when we publish, we're not publishing the raw data. We're not publishing how the data was collected. We're not showing you necessarily how we ran the calculations on the data, how we analyzed it, how we got to those lines and those curves. And more and more, the complex analysis requires new source code, new computer code to actually perform the analysis for us to understand how we got from the observed data to a, a real theory of how that system works. And we need to get back to showing our work. Most of us, when we're in school, we're told you get most of your marks for showing the work, and you get a few marks for actually having the correct answer. And in science, in the last few centuries, we focus too much on publication. Academics have all these measures, and one of the most important is called a H-index. And that's an index of how many papers I've published and the number of citations. I think I have one, I think it might be seven, which is okay. It's not very good, it's not terrible. And I probably wouldn't get an academic job for it. I have contributed tens of thousands of lines of code. I've been one of the primary authors of something called Avogadro, which lets you edit molecular structure and understand materials. It's been downloaded over 400,000 times, but none of that counts towards my academic tenure, and I would not be offered a job on the back of it, and I certainly don't have anyone beating down my door to give me a job in, in, in academia, even though these tools are required in order to do the science. They're a very neglected side of, of what you do, which is why, really, I ended up leaving academia and founding a place like Kitware, where we concentrate on working with academics, national labs, and scientists around the world to develop computer code to help them understand their results and help them to publish it, help them to come up with real data standards that they can actually share the data with other people. It was Graham Steele, I think it was this year or last, who said, really, publishing research without data is advertising. It's not science. You're just advertising that you're doing work, but you're not telling us how you did it, and you're not letting us replicate that. We need to get back to reproducibility, and we need to get back to actually licensing the work as well. So instead of wanting to protect everything, you should remember most of this research is actually paid for with your money. We are doing this research using taxpayer money, and most of what I'm talking about here is funded by the US government, the UK government, the European parliament, the, uh, not the parliament, different research bodies around Europe. But they are, published, they are publicly funding work that scientists do, and they're not necessarily holding the scientists to account. The scientists are not really using the same level of rigging you might expect. And as the world has progressed, we've used computers more and more, but we haven't required the same standards that we required for mathematics. There's a very recent article in uh, April 2013 asking in the Washington Post, is the evidence for austerity measures that have been used throughout the world based on an Excel spreadsheet error? <laughs> there was a student in, uh, I think it was the University of Amherst, doing his PhD, and he wanted to replicate the results in this paper from uh, two very distinguished professors at Harvard. They've got to be right because they have doctorates, and they're at Harvard, it's one of the best schools in the world. But really what it comes down to is that they, they didn't share that Excel spreadsheet initially with the publication. They weren't required to do that. But they published in a, a fairly good journal, and this got the attention of many politicians, and they, they actually decided the fates of economies of whole countries based on what was likely just an Excel spreadsheet. The critical point they observed doesn't exist as far as anyone can tell now. It was just an error. No one checked, no one replicated. So what is open? What do I mean by open? Really, science was always open, but we've, we've moved away from that, we've lost our way a little. And that term open science should be very much redundant, but unfortunately it isn't. Open means everyone needs to have the same level of access. Conditions like no commercial and no derivatives prevent us from really doing things with this, data, with the publication, because many things are commercial activity, 
And if it's publicly funded, really, should you be preventing commercial activity on the back of publicly funded research? The same with no derivatives. If you make a small mistake, and I want to show the people what you did, if I can't make a derivative, I can't necessarily correct those mistakes and show the corrected form. I would give you credit, but I still wouldn't have that right without having to go through and ask you, and I may not be able to get the permission in time. And it makes the level of friction so much higher in terms of actually doing more work. And so there's a lot of science that isn't done right now because the journals hold on to all this publication data and all this publication records, and they don't give it out to the world. When the authors did it on the back of publicly funded research, the reviewers were usually funded by the same grants, the universities are buying back the publications, and we can't do things like meta-analyses. So we can't understand relationships between results published in different papers because we don't have the right to reuse that data to summarize it and then to look at other relationships that might be present that the original authors didn't actually see. And I work with a few people around the world that are trying to change this. This should really shock you, and, and this is a true statement, that six out of 53 landmark cancer studies couldn't be reproduced. Amgen tried to reproduce these. There are various reasons why they may not have been reproduced, but the fact that only 11% of these studies could actually be reproduced, and these were big studies in big journals. And we are trying to stand on the shoulders of those giants, and we find that the foundation is, is not very strong. And if we do future research where we assume what came before is true, then these new studies are also flawed because they are based upon flawed research that can't be reproduced for things that they missed. Recently, this has started to look much better. The Reproducibility Initiative received a $1.3 million grant to actually validate 50 more landmark cancer studies and to try and really make a difference here to see, was that result reproducible? Is it valid? And if we take a small regression in something that was maybe a little easier to understand and a little more close to my heart, I make <laughs> great homebrew. It's the only practical chemistry I do now. Generally sit in front of a computer and, and write code. But I use five-gallon bioreactors, and I make what I call sweet nectar. And I think maybe I discovered a new way of making it better. As the beer ferments, I like to sing to it. <laughs> and I, I think this must work, because yeast is alive, and it can appreciate the, the talents I have in my singing voice. <laughs> and it makes the yeast happier, so they make better-tasting beer. And that is my, my supposition. I, I think that's a good hypothesis. And nine out of ten of my friends said, the beer I sang to tasted better. I even did some chemical analysis. And that beer had less esters. I was able to measure it. They had less esters, so it must be true. How could you doubt what I'd done? I'm a scientist like Dr. Hamwell. You've got to trust what I'm saying. <laughs> and there's all these steps, and yeah, there's, it's a little complicated, but I, I'm pretty sure I controlled for everything. But I got a friend to try and reproduce it, and what it turned out, he couldn't do it. He couldn't reproduce my experiment. The two beers tasted the same to him. Then we looked at it again, we took a step back, and we realized I didn't want to sit in the hot pot in my basement, but I didn't want the other beer to hear me singing. <laughs> so I put it in the bit that wasn't as well air-conditioned. It got a little hotter in there. And if you go back and you really think about it, the yeast actually produce more esters when they're too hot. And they produce these off flavors that we can, we can, we can taste. And I didn't think it really mattered if it got a little hotter. I didn't think about it. And this is really what reproducibility is about. Do I want to sell beer and empirically derive new ways of making it better, or do I want to do science and make it reproducible? Do I want other people to try and reproduce it? And when they do, they can see these flaws in the experiments. And the same things happened in the cold fusion community, where they thought they had discovered cold fusion, they discovered a new way of making energy, and they hadn't. They hadn't control for the experimental conditions, and the science wasn't good in the end. But that's OK. You can still publish things and be wrong, and that's something we should get used to doing. But as scientists, I'm taught I should always be right, because I'm Dr. Hamwell, and I've got a PhD. I should always be right. And that's one of the things I had drummed into my head the whole way through my PhD. I'm becoming an expert. I shouldn't be questioned. Here again, we have a nice linear relation. This thing is obviously going up, along with the thing on the x-axis. <laughs> Global average temperatures are increasing because we're losing pirates. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a line, I, and it's, this is real data. But when you, when you think about it, correlation does not equal causation. Just because you can draw a line for it doesn't mean these two things are related. 
And we need to be very careful. And this is why the public needs to be more engaged with scientists. We need to get out there. I never give talks like this usually. I talk to other scientists or other software developers. But we need to get better as, as scientists at engaging people in the wider world, show them that we don't all wear white lab coats, at least not all the time. Usually we still go out for beer, we make homebrew. <laughs> but in my day job, this is the code I write. And when I publish, if I'm a normal scientist, I would usually just show you these charts, and I would say there's a nice linear relationship in the one on the top, and look, there's a beautiful surface which shows where the electrons live in this vitamin C, I think it is, molecule. And you can see the beautiful 3D graph, and I'm, I'm obviously doing well because I've got so many different points, and I've shown you how I analyzed the data, and I'll explain it. And you've got all the data. This stuff is usually not published. So here we have a mixture of uh, data in the top. We have equations. I turned those equations as a software developer into computer code. The computer code is almost always never shared. And this is a big problem. I can make a small mistake, and my answers might look about right. But as you push it and you try to reproduce what I did, you realize there are some small errors. And I should be more willing to put that source code out there and have other people review it along with the rest of my results. And then show them this as well, but not only. Science is really about how do we push those boundaries, how do we learn new things, and how do we add to the sum of human knowledge. And if we're hiding too much of that, we're not adding to the sum of human knowledge, we're just advertising our work, selling our ideas, and we're working on the old model, which is publish or perish, which is really what the, the play on words was about in the beginning. It shouldn't be publish or perish, it should be open up or perish. Share what you're doing. We're being paid by the public to do this work, and we should make sure we show all of our work, not just pieces of it, the pieces that we're most proud of. I think that's one of the most important points I want you to take away from today, is we need to make science open again. I think things are changing, but we need to continue applying pressure, and we need to continue engaging the public and helping them learn more about how science is done and sharing more of the details of what we did, how we did it, and give you both source code data and the final analyzed results so you're able to question those results and you're able to actually discuss them intelligently with the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you.